Hmm. Get started. Getting started. Good afternoon, everyone. Come on in. Or whatever time you're listening to this, if you're listening later. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's edition of Poto Nation. We've got Raheem Kassam, special guest in the house. What's up, Raheem? Uh, also want to throw a special shout out to Myth Informed. Uh, Myth Informed podcast got me this really cool framed Agent Poso uh, cover. And uh, they sent it here to the office today. So it came in. We did an unboxing. Tom Fitton was here earlier. And uh, he got to see it. And, you know, really cool. So added it directly up right next to my uh, my Polish uprising slash Polish independence armband. And my rosary. My rosary bumper sticker. Pray the rosary, folks. Pray the rosary. So very cool. Very cool on that. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the background of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and North Korea, and what America's strategy can be in those areas. Some people are asking me to clean the camera. It's a little blurry. I'll do what I can. An older camera. Got to get a new one. Working on it. Someone just said they're watching on an airline. It's amazing. I can't believe that you can actually get Periscope in on an airline. So what I wanted to do is really just kind of go back and, you know, no notes, whatever, and uh, give people an, a basic understanding of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and North Korea and those situations and what the state of play is, you know, under, you know, essentially what, uh, why they are set up the way they are and how they came to be this way and what's going on. So, because I was talking to some people this weekend, we were out and people were telling me that they didn't even understand why China was legally able to pass laws in Hong Kong. And they said, because they were talking about this new crackdown that's going on. And they said, why is China allowed to do that? Isn't Hong Kong separate from China or isn't Hong Kong its own city? What's the deal there? And then I, I got to under, to realize that, you know, I think there's just sort of a bad level of education that's going on in America on these issues. And, you know, of course, I understand that, uh, you know, East, uh, East Asia is certainly not um, something that's always on, on everyone's uh, top most important list. But it's important because going forward, America's greatest geopolitical rival is China. In fact, it has been China for a very long time. And so let's go back. So what is what is Hong Kong? Why is Hong Kong separate from China in the first place? Well, China is communist, all right? China is a communist country, all right? They have their own special blend of, chi- of communism. They call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. But Hong Kong was always a separate country. And why is that? The British, uh, the British Empire, set up Hong Kong in the 1890s, really around 1897. Uh, Prior to the British arrival, Hong Kong was a sort of a rock out in the harbor. Um, It was it was used by pirates every once in a while. uh, But it was sort of this rock at the end of the Pearl River. It wasn't really any anything at all. And it was it was Hong Kong that the British who came in and built up Hong Kong as a true international city um, with, of course, fusion from the Chinese mainland, and uh, as, but under the auspices of the British Empire. What they set up was a trading and financial hub for East Asia. And so, um, I'm. by the way, just so you know, in terms of this podcast, in terms of this Periscope, I'm not going to give all of the details and all of the backstory, but I want to just drop a couple of nuggets in so that people could possibly use those for deeper research. This is just meant to be sort of a general overview, a general summary. I'm trying to keep it around 30 minutes long, so you can use this as a touch point if you need to. 
and we'll do some questions at the end. So Hong Kong initially signed, or excuse me, the British Empire initially signed a lease with China for 100 years for the colony of Hong Kong. That lease came up in uh, 1997. And so around that time, or prior to then, there were negotiations between the West and China as to whether or not Hong Kong would be given back. Now keep in mind, in the 1990s, everybody in sort of the, the global order, right, sort of in the, in the global community was sort of, sort of uh, you know, suffering or under the impression, they were, in a, they were in a drunken happy state because the Soviet Union had fallen and it seemed as though liberal democracy was about to spread across the world. And it seemed as though liberal democracy was, had won over communism and that liberal democracy was going to be the new and, and um, <laughs> rightful, um, you know, rightful system for the entire world's population to come under. And so the question after the fall of the Soviet Union from, and, and the end of communism in the Soviet Union was, well, how do we get China to stop being communist anymore? And so one of the ideas was that if Hong Kong were given back to China and that China were welcomed into the international community, into the global forum, that China would then become more capitalist and China would become potentially later, then later more democratic. Uh, it's it's right in the same time frame that China was was given their ascension to the WTO, 1999. Uh, if you remember the Battle of Seattle, this was actually something that the left and it, back over, you know not that long ago actually was against. They vehemently opposed the uh, uh, induction of China for their human rights abuses. So the world was welcoming China into their arms and Hong Kong was something that was given back to China um, as, sort of a, as sort of an entree or a good faith gesture from the West. Um, because of course, at this, of course the, the differences between the, uh, you know, 1897 and 1997 being that uh, sort of the, uh, the sort of swap of power in the West between the British Empire and, uh, and America. You know, certainly post um, post World War One, post World War Two, and uh, and the Bretton Woods system, and you know, we get into all that stuff. But going forward, going forward, Hong Kong was given over, and a deal was struck between the British and the Chinese, so that for fifty years China was not supposed to interfere. Was not supposed to interfere in China's, uh, excuse me, in Hong Kong's internal affairs. Hong Kong was supposed to maintain essentially a, a semblance of independence, maintain their natural rights, their human rights, and their civil rights that were granted under the previous British system. And so this was codified in something called the basic law of Hong Kong. Uh, and now in Hong Kong, there's a there is voting, but it's not the same kind of voting that we have in other countries. Um, but there, suffice to say, there is some voting. Uh, there isn't direct, but there's not direct elections of the chief executive of Hong Kong, uh, sort of the sort of governor role. So what Beijing pledged was that they would allow Hong Kong to maintain their capitalist system, would allow Hong Kong to maintain freedom of speech, to allow elections, and they actually, initially, they had pledged to allow Hong Kong at some point to expand the franchise and allow for direct election of the chief executive of Hong Kong. Uh, that, of course, never happened. And instead, Beijing essentially has begun reneging on their deal. Um, the, the protests over the last couple of years, beginning with the Umbrella Revolution in 2014, and then the protests of 2019, all were because of new laws that mainland China was pushing in Hong Kong through their through pro Beijing legislators that have that have really um, been supported and uh, promoted by Beijing by the Chinese communists. The Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army, also maintains a military garrison 
in Hong Kong. Uh, they are direct. They order. They are directly under order from Beijing. They do. They are not. They do not answer to Hong Kong themselves, but they have a relationship with the local officials, um, which is something that you know I, I know quite a bit about from time my time in the Navy and my time as an inter, an, an uh, intelligence officer in in East Asia. So, and of course the Chinese Navy and uh, also also patrols that that part of the sea. And so what China is doing now is they're essentially reneging on that deal with this new crackdown law and the, and they're calling it terrorism and they're saying that the protesters amount to terrorism and so they can enact a new law and what they're really looking to do is to extradite uh, any individuals from those groups, from those protest groups, the leaders of them, and they're looking to extradite them into mainland China. So uh, as you can imagine, the prison system in mainland China is quite different from that of the prison system of Hong Kong. Problem being, of course, is there's really no way to enforce that deal. There's really no way for uh, there was really no way for the British to enforce that. There was really no way for the Americans to enforce that deal that they made with China early on. They've had essentially no way to, uh, no mechanism to enforce it, at least legally speaking. And so, uh, you know, what's the United Nations going to do? What's NATO going to do or anything like that? Anyway, right? And so that's essentially the status of Hong Kong. Now, what America can do and what the president uh, is doing now is looking at the economics of the situation, because of course, uh, China is economically very beholden to the United States because the United States buys all of China's goods, not just the United States, but again, we're generalizing. So the United States buys China's goods and that is our part of the deal. They do the manufacturing, we, we purchase their goods, their consumer goods. Uh, as well as their pharmaceuticals, which of course is something that's that's come up lately, and and PPE. The fact that we don't build any ourselves, we don't build, uh, we don't manufacture any ourselves, I should say. So that's Hong Kong, and that's essentially the way that the administration is looking at putting the squeeze on China to allow Hong Kong's freedoms, because of course the West for a long time has viewed Hong Kong as sort of a, as sort of an image of itself, Hong Kong itself being a former British colony. Uh, but a former British colony, which is now, unfortunately, in the mouth of the dragon, so to speak. Uh, you cannot change the geography of Hong Kong. There is no real uh, way to stop uh, China from, uh, from you know, basically assimilating Hong Kong over time. And that's the plan. Another country that China plans, or another, I should say, territory that China plans to assimilate over time, this is their, their current strategy, is Taiwan. So what is Taiwan? How, why is Taiwan a separate government from Hong Kong, or excuse me, from China as well? Well, it goes all the way back to 1949, and even prior to that, it goes back to 1911. So to understand Taiwan, you have to understand a little bit of East Asian history. <laughs> My dad made a joke, I'm sorry. He said, it's sort of like New Jersey is to the United States. Dad, come on, very funny. So. Taiwan is different because of the, of, of the history of the Chinese Civil War. The last Chinese dynasty ended in 1911, it was the Qing Dynasty, and it was overthrown by something called the Republic of China. The Republic of China became, uh, which was established by Sun Yat-sen, Sun Zhongshan in Mandarin, and uh, the Republic of China maintained its rule essentially until the Japanese invaded in the 30s, uh, first 33 and then later uh, 38 with a much, a much broader, uh, much broader situation. And so the Japanese essentially occupied all of China that was controlled by the Republic of China. Uh, Republic of China was led by Chiang Kai-shek. However, during this time, there was another group, another powerful group in China that was supported by the Soviet Union. And they were called the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. And they were led by a guy by the name of Mao Zedong. So that's Chairman Mao. So you've got Chiang Kai-shek who is running the Republic of China and you've got also known as the and his party is called the Kuomintang or KMT. Um, then you've got Chairman Mao running the Communists. Chairman Mao is is uh, is backed by the Soviet Union. So during the war, during World War II, uh, during that period of time, Chiang Kai-shek's forces 
were facing off head to head with the Japanese Empire, where while Chairman Mao's forces, though every once in a while they took part in, in a few attacks, for the most part, they kept themselves out in the western and central hinterlands of China in the rural areas. And so they didn't face the full brunt of the Japanese forces. So after Japan lost the war uh, because of the United States in 1945, then Chairman Mao reignited the Chinese Civil War immediately because he knew the Republic of China and Chiang Kai-shek were in a weakened and vulnerable state because of their, their war against the Japanese, or I'd say their defense uh, during the occupation. So from 1945 to 1949, the communists fought and pillaged and raped and killed and murdered their way across China all the way to Beijing, they eventually took Beijing. But the Republic of China and Chiang Kai-shek said, well, maybe we can flee to somewhere else and live to fight another day. So what Chiang Kai-shek did was he took all of his resources, everything he had left, uh, even a ton of resources from the treasury, his military forces, and fled to the island of Taiwan, which is across the strait from mainland China, uh, also known as Formosa by the Portuguese, and uh, it's right across a, a, a province called Fujian. So you had a standoff now where the Republic of China and Chiang Kai-shek are in control of the island of Taiwan, yet while, they al while also maintaining their claim to sovereignty over all of China. At that point, Chairman Mao and the communists have taken over Beijing and the rest of, uh, the rest of China and um, declared themselves the People's Republic of China, which is in control of the entire uh, continent, which control the entire the entire country of China, you know, all the way out to uh, to include Tibet. By the way, they also invaded and took retook control of Tibet. And so, that's essentially been the situation up until now. That's essentially been the situation up to including this day, where the Communist Party controls all of China and maintains that Taiwan is part of the People's Republic even though they don't have physical control over it. And yet Taiwan, which is actually the Republic of China government, which was founded in 1911, maintains that they have control over all of China, even though they don't, you know, sovereignty over all of China, even though they don't have physical control over all of China and Mongolia, by the way, because that was part of China at that point. But Mongolia was, was made independent because the Soviets wanted a little, a little buffer zone there. Didn't trust Chairman Mao that much. That's why they wouldn't give him nukes. It led to something called the China, the Sino-Soviet split. But it's another story. Because I said we're going to be in general today. So that's essentially been the situation there. And then the United States uh, did end up defending Taiwan in that crisis. And also because now think of the timeline. What happened in East Asia just one year later? Right, 1949 to 1950, what happened, let's see you students of history out there, what happened, what major event happened in East Asia in 1950? World event. I'm gonna check the comments on this. Okay, first comment, got it. It's, it's also in the title. Uh, it, it was the Korean War. So the Korean War broke out about one year later. Uh, Chairman Mao's son actually fought and died in the Korean War. People speculate that whether or not a Mao dynasty would have uh, would have sprung forth in China had his son not died in the war. It was you know, his acknowledged son. Uh, the grandson of Chairman Mao is around right now, and let me tell you something: he's not getting ready to start dynasties. Let's put it that way. Suffice to say, he's like a like a sergeant or a colonel or something in the military. Um, but it was the Korean War, and so. The Soviet Union demanded that Chairman Mao send his army to fight against America on the on the Korean Peninsula because at that point it was and people remember the Korean the Americans had made it all the way up to the Yellow River um, and had they pushed across and they could have made it to Beijing um, which was something MacArthur wanted to do he also suggested nuking Beijing um, and certainly would have taken control over all of of the Korean Peninsula however. 
because the Chinese advance, uh, the Americans were then pushed back to the 38th parallel. And we created a situation called the, D the DMZ, and uh, we created a situation called the, the, um, the sea, you know, sort of a ceasefire, sort of an armistice. So the war never officially ended uh, for a very long time. And so you have these sort of lingering um, vestiges of former wars. Uh, so the Opium War between the British Empire and, and, the, uh, and China led to the creation of Hong Kong. The Chinese World War II and the Chinese Civil War led to the creation of Taiwan, the Republic of China there. And then the Korean War, which of course China was involved in, led to the creation of North Korea. And so uh, the status of the United States towards Taiwan has always been that the United States does not recognize Taiwan as an independent country, though it does uh, provide uh, economic, uh, you know, there's economic ties and trade, as well as military, uh, military power that's given that. There's also rumors of, of even certain powerful military technologies that have been shared with Taiwan. And again, I'm just, I'm just, this is an overview. Uh, I'm sure other China hands are going to look at this and say, hey, you know, you left out a whole bunch of stuff. I know. I'm trying to just tell the story for people who don't have all the background knowledge that we do, right? Calm down. So the pre uh, President Trump does have a lot of um, you know, quite a good relationship with the current president of Taiwan uh, named Tsai Ing-wen. Though, of course, in, Hong in Taiwan, where they have democracy, uh, they refuse to, um, they refu China refuses to acknowledge that it's a separate country. Um, they, they, of course, acknowledge, you know, claim that they are a rogue province and that she's a, you know, a, a illegitimate president and everything. So uh, they did actually offer to Taiwan last year to, in 2019, you can go look this up, that Taiwan enter into a deal just like Hong Kong did, so that Taiwan could come back to China the same way Hong Kong did. Now think about that. They saw the crackdowns that were going on in Hong Kong in 2019, and then they offered the same deal to Taiwan. What do you think the Taiwanese said to that? <laughs> what do you think the people of Taiwan said uh, when they saw the crackdowns that were going on in Hong Kong, and then China walks up, Beijing walks up and says, hey, give you guys the same deal we gave Hong Kong. What do you think about that? <laughs> Taiwan said, take a hike. They said, take a hike, because we do not want to become a running dog, you know, a running dog for Beijing. Hong Kong does not want to become a running dog for Beijing. North Korea is a running dog for Beijing, because North Korea, un unfortunately, is isolated from the rest of the world. They do not have substantial trade otherwhere, or, you know, in other countries. Uh, there's some, there's military trade that goes on, of course, um, weapons that are sold uh, from from North Korea to other countries. That is is part of how they generate some income. But really, what their you know their economy is sold, is incredibly dependent on China and their relationship with China. And China wants them isolated, and China wants them poor, and China wants them in a state of uh, near collapse where they're dependent on China, you know? Uh, and so if you look at it from that perspective, you understand how the North Korean situation benefits China. However, I would argue that could we not change that situation to something else? I mean, North Korea and China's relationship, it's kind of like, kind of like a girl who's got in, in a bad relationship or a girl and a guy are in a bad relationship um you know and maybe it's like a, like a girl who's with a toxic guy and he just mistreats her and takes advantage of her takes her for granted keeps her isolated doesn't let her have any friends always keeps her angry but what if, what if someone were to come along and say, you know, I'm not saying you should leave him, but boy, China does not treat you well. 
China really does not treat you uh, treat you right. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you should leave them. I'm just saying they, they really, really doesn't treat you right. Really doesn't treat you right. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe there's, you know, there's, there's other options out there. I mean, keep in mind, you got your whole family right there in South Korea. And they won't even let you go see them. They won't, they won't even let you call your family. What kind of a person take cuts you off from your own family? What kind of a person won't even let you see your family? It's just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, not, I'm just planting seeds. I'm just planting seeds. I'm not, I'm not saying you should do anything. I'm just planting seeds. It's just, it seems to me that there's so much you could do. So much coastline here that you have. Why isn't, why hasn't China ever helped you develop yourself? Why doesn't China want you to work on yourself a little bit? Why doesn't China want you to, to grow, to mature, to become independent, to become self-sufficient? China doesn't want you to do those things, do they? Hmm. It's weird. And, you know, I, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying you should do anything. I'm like, you know, do what you want. I'm just, just planting seeds. I, I just saying, I mean, you should, you should be the best version of your, of yourself, right? Just, just kind of seems, you know, as an impartial observer, as a complete impartial observer, I'd like to say, So folks, what do you think about that? Because let's say, let's just say, could you imagine a situation where the United States now, of course, our greatest strategic threat is China. And what if we were able to separate North Korea from that toxic relationship. And yeah, North Korea has nukes and North Korea has missiles and everything else. And it's, it's kind of hard to get people to give up their nuclear weapons, but maybe, just maybe, could we get them to point them in a different direction? Just saying, just planting seeds, just asking questions, mentioning different things that I see out there in the world. And now you're starting to see the strategy. Now you're starting to see what's going on. And is it possible? Is it possible? Well, they're under new leadership and the new leadership has been willing to talk. And if you start from a position of failure, then you are absolutely going to fail. If you start from a position of that can't possibly happen or that could never possibly work, then you're probably going to get into a self-fulfilling prophecy because you are going into it with a self, it's a self-defeatist mindset. It's a defeatist mindset. You can't have a defeatist mindset. So anyway, this is kind of what I look at. And I say that stuff, you know, I say that stuff regardless of who's president. You know, I was, I remember saying that stuff back in 2014, 2015. Uh, I'll drop some book recommendations in the comments. For North Korea, obviously, Michael Malice, dear reader. Uh, yes, India, uh, Courtney Holland is a great point. India is going to be a big part of our, of our new strategy uh, going forward. But again... Really just wanted to talk about the context of East Asian politics. So Hong Kong, Taiwan, and North Korea. So Hong Kong, Taiwan, and North Korea. 
Look, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is Pyongyang is a lot closer to Beijing than it is to Los Angeles, right? Just saying. I'm really just saying. And if we want, look, I, Hong Kong and Taiwan will probably at some point have a stronger relationship with China. Uh, you, you, you can't change the history. You can't change the people. You can't change the, uh, the location, right, of those places. And yet, what you can do is change how you look at it. And what you can do is change the management in some of those places. And so, if that country were being run by new people, I don't know, then maybe that reunification would make a lot more sense. Maybe it would make a lot more sense. Any other quick questions before I run? Because I mean, I'm not rolling the clock in here, but wanted to keep it, you know, wanted to keep it to a certain point. And that's, oh, that's exactly 30 minutes. Yes! <laughs> I literally wasn't even looking at the clock. And, and yet I just checked it until just now. And I just checked it and it said 30 minutes. Folks. Folks, professional. I'm a professional right here. I'm professional right here. Boxer Rebellion. Yeah, Boxer Rebellion is very interesting. Go check that out. Go look that up if you're interested in um, in some of the rebellions that took place during the Qing Dynasty and uh, how the Republic of China was formed in the first place. Sun Yat-sen, very interesting guy. Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and Chiang Kai-shek's, uh, his wife and her sisters, you know, very interesting. You know, very interesting history there. Um, not too many good movies about all this, unfortunately. Um, Last Emperor is pretty good, but there's not a ton of really good, you know, really good movies out there about any of this, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just the West doesn't, you know, seem to care very much about East Asian history. And, uh, of course, China doesn't want, you know, I think the last like movie that came out where China was even portrayed negatively was um, Seven Years in Tibet, uh, which of course mo mainly focuses on the Dalai Lama. Um, but then of course China shows up at the very end. And because of that movie, because of Seven Years in Tibet, uh, Brad Pitt was given a lifetime ban from the People's Republic of China. Yeah, there's a great book on Mao. It's literally just called Mao by uh, by Jung. It's very, very good. Go check that out. Uh, Hundred Year Marathon, of course. Michael Pillsbury, very, very, very good. Um, just mentioning a few things. But I'm I'm here for you. And if anybody wants to to just just drop a question. Um, Feel free to ask. If you have other questions, just ask them. In the, you can drop them in the comments as well. So how should the UK have responded? I think somebody was asking. Um, how should the UK have responded? Well, that's that's the problem, right? The UK does, is not the British Empire anymore. The UK is not the British Empire anymore. And instead, now they're... Uh, you know, now they're in a status where they've started in some cases to fall under the influence of China. And so, you know, they're at a real turning point, a real crossroads where they should decide, do they want to go down that road or do they want to stay in the Anglosphere with the other English speaking nations that have really been in the driver's seat for a very long time between the UK, between the United States, Canada, and Anzac. I see some people saying, but, but Jack, wasn't it a legal agreement between China and the, and, and the UK? Well, no, obviously not, right? It was because, as I said before, the Qing dynasty uh, was in control of China in 1897. And yet, and then it becomes the communists that are in charge of China in 1997. 
here. That's a completely different regime. That's a completely different group of people. And so uh, any treaty that was signed with the previous government um, is obviously open to renegotiation when the communists have, there was a communist takeover in between folks. There was a communist takeover in between, but it was the British who decided to honor that agreement, even though they had had the Chinese uh, communist takeover in 1949. So they chose to do that. And that's, you know, that's on them. Look, the policy was, we're going to try. We're going to try to allow China into the international community, tried it for 20 years, and it's been a complete failure. But this is how we got there, okay? We have to understand, to understand where we are, we have to understand how we got here. It didn't happen overnight, okay? It didn't happen overnight. There was globalism with the goal of China's rise and China's profit and power and influence uh, was, was the beneficiary. Oh, so, you know, Courtney's asking, didn't Clinton push for China? Yeah, Clinton, the Bushes, uh, Obama, you know, this has been, this has been going on for quite some time. This is going on for quite some time. Uh, this is, you know, this, this is, isn't, isn't a Republican Democrat thing. This isn't a, uh, you know, left versus right kind of thing. It's about whether or not we want the United States. What's up, Ian? Ian Miles Chong is in. Ian has entered the chat. And, uh, you know, this isn't something that's like a liberal Democrat thing. It's, it's nationalism versus globalism, if you look at it that way. And so uh, this is, you know, do we want to, to continue the so-called managed decline of America and the, uh, while we sit back and watch the inevitable rise of China? Or can we take steps to maintain our country and to maintain our prosperity and our freedom, okay, to take care of our people and our, our workers at the same time that we don't allow China, which is currently controlled by a communist regime, a totalitarian, atheist, uh, technocratic regime led by uh, Chairman Xi Jinping, and do we want to allow them to gain preeminence and dominance over over all of Asia because keep look what they're doing in the South China Sea look what they're doing to Hong Kong look what they're threatening to do to Taiwan okay so this is you know and more importantly from of course from an electoral perspective look what they've done to us on trade right that's that's and that's the key issue that is the key issue look what they've done to us on trade and if you understand that from uh, a voting standpoint not not even to mention, because it's, this isn't a coronavirus periscope, um, but this video uh, is about China. So, of course, not only was coronavirus the fault of China and the cover up and uh, everything else that's come out, but certainly it's China and the fentanyl. Here's, of course, the fentanyl that's been flooded from China. This is the great issue, because when you look at it in terms of in terms of trade, in terms of fentanyl, the opioid crisis, and, and the current pandemic. What do they all have in common? It's China. What do they all have in common? And so China is rising, but it is not rising responsibly. It is rising as a threat to the world. It's a rising threat to the world. Isn't really any other way to say it. There isn't really any other way to say it. And for 20 years, we've just been watching it. For 20 years, we've just been sitting back and watching them do it. As they expanded their military, they pushed out territorially, they pushed out in the maritime space. They're doing this. And 
do we want to and while yes yes Wes, well you know we sat down and argued about whether or not donald trump had russian hookers in his moscow uh his moscow bedroom thanks to jake tapper that's the state of play folks that's the state of play what can we do number one the number one thing we can do is economic the number one thing we can do is economic to china so you know this happened for a very long time it's been happening since the the first bush administration um you know the, uh, both bushes really clinton obama etc that's the state of play as we've gotten here so 1997 on forward um, but even before that i mean even before then there were these talks were were in um I say they're ongoing, one thing they're ongoing. And so what you could do is to hit China economically and to divest our trade from China, to divest our um, ability to essentially ship our, our wealth to China. Why do that? Why should we continue to send our money to China? Why do we continue this relationship? Why do we continue to finance and uh, the rise of China? Really as simple as that, folks. Really as simple as that. And so this is something that there's no quick and easy fix to it. There's no uh, legislative thing that's going, there's no magic bullet, right? There's no magic bullet uh, to this. And of course, you know, um, you know, you've got a guy like Joe Biden who has been part of this program. Remember, as I've talked to you for the past 30 years or so, Joe Biden has been uh, the head of America's foreign relations in terms of the Senate. He was one of the leaders his entire time in government of, uh, of championing for stronger relations with China, for opening up the US to China, for shipping our jobs to China. That's Joe Biden's legacy. And, and by the way, I don't say that politically. I really don't say that politically from a left versus right thing that's simply been his record that is it's it's completely public anyone can go and look on it and so uh joe biden has been riding shotgun as a running dog for china for a very very long time uh joe biden didn't speak out when hong kong was given to china joe biden didn't speak out when american jobs were being shipped to china joe biden didn't speak out when American factories were closing and the jobs were going to China. You no, know, he was bringing his son Hunter over there with him to sign uh, billions of dollars in deals. Okay, that's what Joe Biden was up to. And so to look at this situation, you have to say, well, we need someone who can take care of this job, this situation. We need someone who can understand how to move forward on this, all right? And this has to be a whole of society effort. It can't just be one person, it can't just be one party. And I would honestly, I would honestly sit here before you and say, I welcome and I urge Nancy Pelosi to return. I urge Nancy Pelosi to return to the side of America against China. Nancy Pelosi, stood up for the students of Tiananmen Square in 1989. Nancy Pelosi went to Tiananmen Square to protest in the 90s. Nancy Pelosi used to actually be a very strong voice on China. A very strong voice on China. And somewhere along the line, that changed. So I would urge that Nancy Pelosi as the head of the Democrat Party, which she is, come on, she is. I would urge her to take the side of her country and yes, you know, we certainly don't agree with, you know, with Nancy Pelosi on China, on, excuse me, on, on every topic, you know, politi politically, we don't agree. But I would personally welcome Nancy Pelosi back into the fight because this is not about party. This is not about elections. This is about country before party. And if we want the United States to continue to maintain its prosperity, if we want the world to be able to continue to maintain these freedoms, 
and our international system of trade, our international system of agreements and frameworks between countries, we cannot allow China to continue to do what it's been doing. So, you know, clearly Joe Biden's not the answer. But I would also get I would also suggest to Trump supporters. I would also suggest to Trump supporters that it's our job to hold Donald Trump's feet to the fire, to push for those sanctions, to push for those tariffs, to push for using every tool, possibly even defaulting on our treasury bills, defaulting on the debt. It's our job to hold Trump's feet to the fire to make sure that he does that as well and to return those manufacturing jobs to the United States, the factories of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Minnesota. This is what he ran on. This is what needs to happen for a variety of reasons. Right. This is this is existential, folks. This is existential. This is existential. If we want the United States to continue on, this needs to happen. And if you guys out there are folks who are Donald Trump supporters, then you have to maintain holding his feet to the fire as well. That's all for me, folks. Jack Posobiec here. Oh, one last thing I'm going to say. We absolutely need to beat China in space. Not only does the United States have to be number one in space exploration, we need to achieve space dominance. Barack Obama shut down the space shuttle program. He shut down the Constellation program. He turned the NASA's telescopes inward towards Earth. We need to start looking outward again. When I was a kid, America had spaceships. And now I'm a dad, and America doesn't. Think about that. We need to get back to space, folks. We need to, as a country and as a society. The political will is there with the people, but it's not there with the government yet. That's another thing we have to do is to hold the government's feet to the fire on this because Republicans have been pushing wars in the Middle East. Republicans have been pushing invasions all around the world. Can't have it. We don't need to invade the Middle East anymore. What we do need to do is to maintain our dominance in space before the Chinese get there. Because do you think the Chinese are going to slow down their space program? Do you think the Chinese are going to shut theirs down? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So do you want them to get there first? Do you, do you want the first do you want the first base on the moon or the first colony on the moon to be run by China? Do you want to see the red flag of China? on the moon? And Chinese astronauts up there? Actually called taikonauts. Or do you want Americans doing that? It's a simple question, folks. It's a very simple question. Who do you want in the driver's seat?
United States of America or the People's Republic of China. Because I guarantee you that the, their world, a world where China has primacy in finance, in trade, and in space, is going to be a very, very different world than the one that we've been used to. Folks, thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us. Louise Mensch, you're welcome back anytime. Appreciate the comments. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, you have my permission to lay ashore.